Andrew Claven of The Daily Wire complained that the phrase Christ is King is being used as an anti-Semitic dog whistle. He then went on to espouse the heresy of universalism, insisting that many people are faithfully serving Jesus just without knowing it. Tune in now as we carefully debunk these claims. All right, welcome back to the Wednesday live stream. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, uh, what we do is Wednesday uh, and uh, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So we have three shows every week at 4 p.m. Central Time. It's on Twitter, it's on YouTube. Uh, it, you know, it drops a little bit after on the podcast platform, Spotify, Apple, and then uh, and it'll pop up on our website and our app. But mainly, uh, if you want to watch right when these episodes come out, it's 4 p.m. Central Time on Monday and then Wednesday and Friday on Twitter and YouTube. That's where you'll uh, get the first glimpse and. So so uh, today, what we're doing, Monday is a pre-recorded episode with guests that I pipe in. Friday, we call it the Friday Special. It's a multi-part series. We're about to start, uh, actually next week, we'll start uh, season two for Q2, season two of the Friday Special uh, with Brian Sauve and Ben Garrett, a Haunted Cosmos-themed 10-part series, which is going to be incredibly unhinged. Today, we are going to be hinged. We're going to do our best to be self-controlled and to be careful and to, uh, to be uh, utterly uh, biblical and everything that we say, because this is a very controversial topic, but the truth has to be told. So I want to be careful, but I also want to be courageous and uh, and not bend the knee to uh, cultural and um, worldview, religious whims of our day. Uh, Christ is king. We make no apology for saying it. Uh, we will say Christ is king even harder. Um, Christ is king, and we're going to talk about the kingship of Christ, and we're going to talk about the claims from Andrew Claven that came over this last weekend uh, that some individuals are using that phrase, Christ is king, as a anti-Semitic dog whistle. Um, we're going to show the clip from Claven, but before we do, and there's two main errors that he makes. Uh, one, I think, is uh, the way that he subtly defines anti-Semitism. And so we're going to talk about that. What is anti-Semitism? Um, and we're going to talk about the uh, the assumed definition that he kind of bakes into the equation. And I think it's done subtly, uh, but it's fairly easy to pick up once you notice it. And so uh, we want to talk about uh, the wrong assumed definition that Clavin is um, assuming and asserting in this clip of anti-Semitism. And then secondly, we want to talk about uh, universalism, uh, because Clavin espouses universalism. And if there was any question, and this clip is definitive, uh, it is not taken out of context. It's very clearly his view. I I've heard him espouse this view in the past. And if there was still question, um, then th there shouldn't be any question uh, in the sense that he recently went on uh, the, the Cross Politic uh, podcast with Toby Sumter and Chuck Knox and uh, Gabriel Wrench, and uh, they asked him explicitly, you know, what what do you, you know, you made this claim, it sounds, you know, like universalism. It right. sounds like um, denying the exclusivity of Christ, right? right. Jesus says, um, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me, you know, or uh, no man can come to the Father unless uh, he gives him to the Son, hmm. um, you know, and so uh, Jesus is the door. He is the way. He is the only way. There, um, you know, it's been said by people in the past that, you know, well, this person is a a devout Muslim um, who uh, doesn't recognize Jesus as the uh, the um, eternal Son of God, but uh, but she has the fruit of the Spirit because she's filled with peace and joy. And no, right. no, yep. she does not have the fruit of the Spirit because she does not have the Spirit. Spirit, and she doesn't have the Spirit because the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. And when you deny the Son, you don't get the Spirit. And that doesn't mean that she's not a kind outwardly man, outward manifestations of 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 being a, a kind, um, humane person in many regards, but she is not regenerate, as she does not have the Spirit, and therefore she uh, she does not have the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, but Clavin made it basically sound like uh, that, you know, this person, a person like Ben Shapiro, for instance, and he cites Ben Shapiro, and we'll get there, um, that could be serving Jesus without knowing it. Right. Um, and, yeah. it and, and he's not just saying that um, a, a non-Christian underneath the, the ultimate banner of the sovereignty of God uh, could be used in outwardly benevolent ways towards humanity and the church. Certainly that's true. Cyrus, we don't know if he yeah. was regenerate, but um, certainly he was used by God and his sovereignty to be good to the Jews. We see that in Ezra and in Nehemiah. Um, so this idea, I mean, the, the, the Bible says that the, the heart of a king is like waters, right. like rivers, and he guides it in whichever direction uh, he wants it to go. Trump, Donald Trump. I, I appreciate Donald Trump. I respect Donald Trump in many ways. Um, I, I'm grateful for him. I don't believe that uh, Donald Trump, from, from his own words, 
um, over many years and many speeches, right? I mean, the guy, you know, would typically give a 45 minute speech on a daily basis. So it's not like, it, you know, just an isolated clip from everything that I've heard from Donald Trump. I could not say God alone sees the heart. That's true. But I could not say with any confidence that he's born again. I, I pray that he uh, that God saves him and that he would be born again. Um, but as of now, if if you're saying uh, Joel, you you need to bet your life um, on on a yes or no. Is Donald Trump uh, saved? Is he mm -hmm. born again, regenerate? I'd say no. Um, and so, uh, but my point is, in bringing up Donald Trump, God has used him in profound ways that um, have been uh, good for the church. Also negative. Uh, but but in my lifetime, he has been the best president of the United States uh, for. Uh, for the country as a whole, and, and particularly for Christian people. I know that's a low bar, but you get my point. So <laughs> God can sovereignly use unregenerate non-Christians, absolutely. But Clavin goes further than right. that. I don't think that he's just saying, well, Ben Shapiro is being used by God in, in outwardly positive ways while denying Christ inwardly, and, and, um, and therefore he's not a Christian, and therefore when he stands before God, he will be judged and cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. Uh, but I love Ben Shapiro because he's my friend, and I'm praying for sa salvation. That's not what Clavin said. Mm -hmm. That's not what he's asserting. And if, and if there's any lack of clarity from this clip, I, I encourage you to follow up and watch the podcast uh, episode that just dropped yesterday with Cross Politic, where Clavin makes it abundantly clear. And I told you guys I wasn't going to bring this up, but I'm, I'm going to bring it up. Um, <laughs> it's very reminiscent. And I think this is part, partly where Clavin yeah. is probably getting it from, because uh, I know that Clavin is a big C.S. Lewis fan. And full disclosure, so, so am I. Yep. I love C.S. Lewis. Very grateful for his works. Uh, my my kids, you know, we've gone through the whole Narnia series, and and uh, and then we we paused because we had to read The Hobbit, and now we're finishing Treasure Island, and then we'll probably go back to Narnia. Like my kids, by the time they're grown, will have read all the Narnia books, you know, um, multiple times. Right. Uh, if I have any say in it, and I do because I'm their dad. <laughs> so uh, so a big fan of the Narnia series, but uh, C.S. Lewis um, did not have great theology. Um, on some things he did, things, but on other yeah. things he didn't. Anthropology especially was really good. Yeah. Yes. Uh -huh. Abolition of man, you know, there's uh, that great hideous divorce. strength. There's multiple. Yes, he had great profound insight into the human condition yep. uh, in light of uh, the, the, the biblical truth. And, and so very helpful. But one thing that Lewis says in the Narnia series, it's the last, the book, last book, right? The, uh, which is called The Last Battle. And The Last Battle is uh, between uh, the Calamans and uh, the Narnians. And the Calamans, they worship a false god named Tash. And Tash is not a benevolent god like Aslan. Um, uh, Aslan loves uh, his people and he's good to the Narnians and, um, and you know, he's benevolent and kind and, and generous and all these things and gives his life for Edmund, you know, in, in the line, the witch in the wardrobe, uh, whereas Tash demands the life of his people. Right. He's a cruel mm -hmm. master and, uh, and he even lives off of, off of the, the blood of his, his people. They're, they're sacrificed to him and he eats them and kills them. And, and so he's a very wicked uh, God. And some people, you know, some C.S. Lewis scholars have noted that um, it, it may be a comparison between Christians and uh, Islam right. and, and yeah. reminiscent of Allah. And I think that that probably is a fair comparison, right. maybe a little bit too on the nose. Maybe the comparison breaks down, you know, not at every level, but I think there are some uh, something there. And so all that being said, there's one particular soldier in Tash's, in the, in the Kalerman's army, in their militia, high up soldier. Um, I, I think he's a general or a lieutenant or something like that. Uh, but he has, he's different than all the uh, other Kalermans in the sense that he has good character. He's, he's far more reasonable and understanding and benevolent and, um, and, and, and kind. He's not as cruel as, as the Kalermans are known for being, uh, but he is devout uh, it, religiously. And so he's a devout worshiper of Tash. And, uh, and it all leans up to this, this scene where he goes into the barn where Puzzle the donkey had been, you know, at, disguised with this lion skin as Aslan and, um, and, and you know, get, uh, Shift the ape was using him to get all the Narnians to do stuff um, and, and bend to his will. And, but now uh, Tash has, has come and set up headquarters in this little stable. And, um, and this Calamarin, uh, the, the good Calamarin, he goes in there and, uh, you know, he's going to go before his God, his maker, as far as he, he knows, Tash, who he's worshipped all his life. And he goes and, and, and Tash disappears and, uh, and, and is run off by Aslan. And Aslan manifests and is, meets him in the stable. And essentially uh, what Aslan says is that uh, you have been a devout worshiper of Tash all your life, denying um, Aslan, denying me and, and, and saying that the Narnians are wrong and warring against the Narnians and all these things, but, uh, but you've been essentially, Aslan says, but you've ultimately been a good man. And so you actually were serving me just by another name. Right. 
And that's essentially exactly what Clavin says in this clip. Mm -hmm. And if there was any question, again, he 100% confirms that uh, when he goes on Cross Politic, which aired yesterday. You can find it on, on YouTube. Um, it's this, this same sentiment that Lewis articulates in, in the last battle of uh, the Narnia series that uh, essentially that someone, not just that they could be uh, as an unregenerate a non-believer be used under the banner of God's sovereignty as all people are under God's sovereignty. No, um, it's further than that. It's this person worshiping another God, a devout religious person serving another God could still in the final analysis, when they die, stand before Christ and uh, Christ say, as Aslan said to this Calamarin, uh, um, say Christ essentially say, oh, you, you're welcome into heaven. You're saved uh, yeah. because you actually have been serving me, although you uh, served me uh, by, under the, the banner of Allah or Buddha right. or, or whatever. And um, that is heresy. That's not just, oh, you're off on this. Um, that's heresy. That is not a biblical Christian profession of faith. That denies um, that denies all the historic creeds. That denies the New Testament, the Old Testament. Um, that is not a Christian belief. And so, my prayer um, is that Clavin would repent. Um, yeah. That he would repent of of that false doctrine. And I'm not saying false doctrine because I, I want you to feel the the proper weight of this. I'm not saying false doctrine like um, you know I don't. Uh, a difference of pedo baptism or credo baptism right. or continuationism, mm -hmm. uh, you know, tongues and prophecy versus cessationism, right? There are certain secondary doctrines uh, that, that somebody could hold a view that is ultimately in the final analysis is unbiblical. It's wrong, right? right? We're not relativists. We can't all be right. So if there are two directly contradicting views, you, you can both be wrong, but you both can't be right. And yet, although one person may be wrong in this secondary uh, theological category, it doesn't mean that they're an unbeliever. Right. But but what we're going to show you in this clip, and we'll get to that in a moment, but in this clip is uh, that, that this idea uh, is espousing universalism, which is a heresy. This is a top-tier theological category, uh, primary doctrine. It's not secondary or tertiary. And to be wrong on this um, is a, a really big deal and does absolutely call into question a person's salvation. And so yeah. I, I pray that Clavin uh, would repent um, of, of that view. Um, it's absolutely wrong. So uh, two things that you're going to see in this short clip from Clavin, we're going to break it up. So we'll show you the first half and then the second, first half, and then we'll, we'll talk about anti-Semitism. Um, and then the second half, and we'll talk about universalism. Uh, but the two big errors that Clavin uh, remarkably makes in a very short period of time um, <laughs> is uh, uh, the first is um, his subtle definition of anti-Semitism. And that's what I want you to see first. And then we'll talk about what actually is anti-Semitism. Right. And uh, before we get into it one more time, just got to say Christ is king. Sorry, not sorry. <laughs> we make no apology. Christ is king. And if some people are saying that in vain, fine, whatever. But uh, Christ is and, king. And, and not ethereally. Right. Yep. Yeah. Now. Not, yeah, right yeah. He now. is king here and now. Not at some future point, yep. and, and not a king in, in heaven or king in the, the 17th dimension. Christ's kingship is both present and here. The kingdom yep. has come. He is in our midst. And that is a political statement. Yes. That's right. another thing. People are saying, well, but uh, if you're saying that because you actually believe that, that Christ is king uh, in the religious sense, in the biblical sense, uh, but if you're saying it as a political statement just to score cheap points, no, no, it is a political it is statement. A political statement. Yeah. It's a gospel statement. It's a universally true statement. It's a biblical statement, religious statement, spiritual statement, and it is an earthly political statement. Herod understood the kingship of Jesus Christ. There's a reason why Herod knew it wasn't just that someone meek and mild had been born. Is Christ meek and mild? Yes. Yep. But he's not only meek and mild. He's not just the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's not less than that. Certainly not less. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He's also the Lion, the right. Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is uh, the King who is ruling, who will break the kneecaps of his enemies with an iron scepter. He is a thrice holy God, not just humble and meek and mild, but he is terrible in his judgments, the scripture says. Uh, he by no means will part of the, the wicked. That's uh, Exodus chapter 20. The only hope we have is to be actually covered in the righteousness mm -hmm. of Christ, which comes by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. And so uh, when we say Christ is king, it is a spiritual, religious, biblical statement, but it is also a political statement. Uh, Herod knew that a king not just Messiah or, or, a, um, or a religious teacher had been born, but he knew according to the prophecies, a king yeah. had been born, and he knew that that king being born on earth, incarnate, uh, that that was a threat to all other kingdoms. 
yeah. to the kingdoms of this world. That's why Herod sought to kill Jesus and, and killed all the little boys born in Bethlehem because he knew uh, that, that Jesus was a threat. Um, a, a political threat, an earthly threat, a tangible threat to the rulers of this world. And you might say, well, that's not what Jesus did. He says, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh -huh, but his kingdom is in this world. It's not of this world, meaning it doesn't operate on worldly principles. And the source of the power and authority for his kingdom is otherworldly. But his kingdom, although not of the world, it is in the world, and you might say, well, Jesus didn't try to overturn Rome. Yeah, but the teaching of the apostles, which Christ commissioned, eventually did overturn Rome. That is the fruit of Christ's kingship, is that real political kingdoms are eventually, if they are opposed to Christ, they are overturned. Yeah. Um, yep. that, that is, the, so it is a political statement. So when I say Christ is king, um, I am saying in the biblical sense, in the eternal sense, in the universal sense, the gospel sense, and the law sense, and in the political sense. Yes. Christ is king, and every political ruler or religious, false worldviews and false religious rulers on this earth who are opposed to his kingship, they will, uh, they will break. Matthew Henry once said, every knee that does not bow yep. will break. Uh, so you can either bow your knees in this life by grace, or your knees will eventually be broken in this life, perhaps, or if not, certainly in the life to come. Right. So it is a political statement. And if some people are saying, uh, Christ is king, you dirty. Okay, well, uh, I I'm not saying that. And, yeah. and I don't think people should say that. But if they're saying Christ is king, and this means that the Jew must repent, and the Muslim must repent, and the Buddhist must repent, and, and James Lindsay, the atheist, must repent, yeah. then amen, amen, and we will never, ever, ever apologize for that. So without further ado, here's a clip from Andrew Claver. You know, when I did this, by the way, the priest who baptized me said, you know, Christians won't accept you, They'll, you'll still be a Jew, and I said, well, I am, a, that's my race, I'm a Jew, I'm proud of my race, it's a, it's a great race, it's done many, many great things, including write the Bible, and you know, I am a Jew, but that hasn't happened at all. Christians have welcomed me with open arms, except this Christ the King, anti-Semitic crowd. Christ is the King, and one day every knee will bow and recognize it, because he's not just my King, he's King of the universe. But when you use that phrase to mean that God has abandoned his chosen people, the Jews, through whom he came into this world incarnate, and that he's broken his promises, his covenant with the Jews, you are quoting scripture like Satan does in the Bible. You are quoting scripture to your purposes, and that to me is specifically wicked. You know. All right, let's stop there. Okay. We'll get to the second. So the second half of the clip is we'll get into the universalism, uh, which is just apparent in the second half of the clip. But what I want you to notice, and I'm going to turn it to Michael and Wes here because I know I'm, I'm talking a lot. I, I'm going to talk a lot more. I, I, I'm passionate about this issue. I have a lot to say on it, but all three of us do. But the first thing that I want you to notice is what Andrew Claven says. He says this Christ the King anti-Semitic group. Okay, so he's saying, um, he's, he's to be fair to Claven, he's not saying everyone who says Christ is King is anti-Semitic, but he's saying that some are. Um, but then he he goes on to to explain precisely what he means by that, and and notice what he says is he doesn't say these guys who are saying Christ is the King, therefore um, we should commit genocide uh, with the nation state of Israel. No, that's not the example he right. uses because that would of course be anti-Semitism. Right. If if they were saying Christ is the King and therefore death to every Jew. That's anti-Semitism. That's that is wishing uh, physical harm. That's ha putrid hatred towards um, a, a, both a religious and ethnic group. That would be wrong. But that's not what Clavin says. And this is not an accident. This is what I. You have to be aware of this. Clavin says. Um, I, uh, Christians have welcomed me with open arms, so for the most part, they've been very uh, welcoming and receptive to me, except for this Christ the King anti-Semitic group. Okay. So you can say Christ is King, but some people are saying it, and they mean it as anti-Semitism. Okay, Clavin, uh, work that out for us, flesh it out. What's that mean? Define it. And then what does he say? Um, they're anti-Semitic. This is what he's saying. They're anti-Semitic because they deny God's promises for Israel. They say that God yeah. broke his promises for Israel or God's not going to fulfill his promise. So notice for, for Clavin, and, th and then he follows it up just in case there was any, any question. He says, those who say that God's denied his promises for Israel or not, not going to, he's broken his promises. He's not going to fulfill uh, these future promises for Israel. He says, that's wicked. He uses the word wicked. So he's saying there's yeah. this uh, Christ is the king anti-Semitic group. 
Um, and then, and then, what does anti-Semitism mean in this context for Clavin? It means uh, hating the Jews. No. It means wishing them physical harm. No. It means wishing them spiritual harm. No. It just means denying that they're God's favored, special people with futuristic in our future, right? Not just at the time of, of, of the uh, writing of, of the New Testament, but in our future now in 2024, 2000 years later, still in our future, there are, are either land promises or at least at minimal spiritual promises for the nation of Israel still in our future today. To deny that, to say that, uh, that, that there are not these uh, promises and that, that the uh, Israel, according to the flesh, ethnic Israel, the nation state of Israel, are not God's chosen people today, to deny that is what he is equating as being wicked. Um, mm, and, yeah. and that is ridiculous. And let me just give you one illustration, and then we'll show you three orthodox views. Um, they're not all right, but they're all orthodox, okay? Three orthodox views within, um, within Christian faith um, that that uh, a person can hold uh, in regards to uh, Israel. And so that's what I want to break down in a moment. But let me just give you this illustration real quick from atheism. Let's use atheism as an example. Do atheists believe that uh, the Jews are God's chosen people? No, they don't even believe there is a God. James Lindsay doesn't believe that the Jew. Catch this irony real quick. James <laughs> Lindsay it's, on it's... Twitter is coming after uh, alleged anti-Semite Christians... Um, but but he doesn't even believe God exists. Yeah. James Lindsay doesn't believe that the Jews are God's chosen people. How can there be a God's chosen people without a God? So so are all think about that for a second. You need to be able to answer this question. Are all atheists? And this this is just one example, right? Atheists are not the only only group, but it's just an easy group to use to make make the point. Um, are all atheists uh, inherently anti-Semitic? Is anti-Semitism innate? to atheism or any other religion or Buddhism or Islam. Nope. Exactly. It, it, it literally would come down to this. Every single religion except for Judaism. And maybe you could carve out an exception for the dispensational uh, evangelicals, dispensationalist within uh, the Christian category. But everyone else outside of that, atheists are just one example, right. but you're right. It, it would be Muslims. It would be Buddhists. It would be atheists. It would be agnostics. Um, Nobody else believes that the Jews are God's chosen people. So, so are are Clay, I, I would want to know from Clavin: Are uh, is James Lindsay an anti-Semite? Uh, are all atheists? Are you claiming that all atheists? Because all atheists deny that there's any divine promise for Israel because they d deny a divinity. Right. 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 So, so are you claiming that all atheists are anti-Semitic? Uh, and if not, and and I would hope not. If not. Um, then, then are any Christians allowed? Are you calling into question uh, motives, character, uh, uh, um, uh, salvation? All the, uh, and I am calling into question Clavin's salvation. I won't be, I won't be uh, ambiguous about that. I am calling into question your salvation due to your the, the second portion of the clip that we're going to show uh, your universalism. But I would want to know from Clavin: Are you calling into question any Christians? Um, who who simply don't believe that the Jews are still, not that they never were, every Christian believes that the Jews under the old covenant were God's chosen people from whom he brought about the Messiah. Right. Uh, but 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 are you saying that that as a prerequisite for not being anti-Semitic, for not being wicked, it, which is the word you use? It was more used, than wicked. It was, it was treating scripture the way that Satan treats scripture. Yeah. So do you think all Christians are twisting scripture in a satanic form in a satanic way, and wicked and anti-Semitic um, if they simply believe that uh, the Jewish people, ethnically speaking, today and in the year of our Lord, 2024, are no longer God's covenant people, and that he therefore does not have any, in our future, any futuristic promises right. for them. Are, are we saying that, that that view held by any Christian is uh, inherently anti-Semitic, satanic right you're right because that's that's the words used and wicked and wicked um and jenna ellis said heresy over the weekend yeah and jenna ellis yep. called she it said, a heresy yeah she's so funny and and what yeah. she called a heresy uh was uh covenant theology right i mean uh, what she they, called they label it replacement replacement which yeah. just for you need to know that also listener replacement theology don't use that phrase that yeah. is a pejorative that is a derogatory demeaning intentional pejorative um it, it the, the doctrine is um, supersessionism, 
Um, or you could call it simply fulfillment, fulfillment. theology. Yeah. It's not that God broke his promises with Israel. And we're going to get into this. It's that God, uh, uh, covenant theology holds, and this is the historic view of Christianity. Dispensationalism is, is the novel view. That's the new view yeah. on the scene from Schofield and Darby yep. um, and, and, you know, in the mid 1800s, yeah. right? So it's only about 150 years old. Um, but but if you're looking at the Puritans, you're looking at the Reformers, you're looking at church fathers um, for, for uh, 1,850 years, right? Are you going to condemn? That's what Jenna Ellis is doing. She's yeah. condemning um, every Christian for 1,850 years. Yeah. Um, uh, to, to fulfillment theology, it's not replacement theology, um, but fulfillment theology is saying not that God broke his promises or failed to keep his promises, but that God has already fulfilled his promises. He he did is fulfilling. Yeah. Is fulfilling. Is well is fulfilling in the church. Yes. Yes. In right. the church. But but Israel, according to the flesh, God fulfilled those promises. Read the book of Joshua, yeah. right? We we talked yeah. through the book of Joshua in our church uh, recently, and now we're in the book of Ezra, and all these things have been incredibly timely for what's going on in our culture. But Joshua, the, the, towards the end of the book of Joshua, I believe it's chapter 20 or 21, um, uh, the Lord uh, speaks through Joshua and says, uh, he says, uh, once they had had uh, fought all all these wars of conquest in the land of Canaan, yeah. um, it says, uh, and the Lord brought about, it says he fulfilled all his promises, not some or yeah. most, all of his promises, which he made through Moses to give you all the land. Yeah. So here's the deal. Uh, the land promises for Israel, uh, it's not that God changed his mind. It's not that he made a promise and then said, well, I'm not going to keep it. No, no, uh, God, God did it. Yep. He he did it like a long time ago. Um, and then the problem is that Israel was faithless and eventually was spewed out of the land. But but God fulfilled his which land he promises. Which would happen. Which he also said would happen. Post-exilic yeah. prophets, so like Isaiah, like sooner would a nursing mother forget her child than I would forget you, O Israel, Malachi, uh, I the Lord change not, so you the sons of Jacob are not consumed. Uh, those are fulfilled in the church, in the true people of God. We, the people of God, are not consumed because God doesn't change. Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. So land promises and those post-exilic prophets, Isaiah, Malachi, those others, those are found in God's true people, the children of Abraham by faith. Right, exactly. Children according to the promise, by the Spirit, and not merely by the flesh. Uh, but, but the point is what Jenna Ellis said about replacement theology, which again, fulfillment theology, that this has already been fulfilled. Um, she, and, and she... she said explicitly it's heresy and multiple people questioned her on twitter about it and she doubled down and doubled down and doubled down and said heresy 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 um and uh you just need to know that's um <laughs> that is not merely condemning uh some far alt-right you know yeah. whatever uh right. she, she is saying that that statement um is is explicitly saying that um that rc sproul yeah. spent his life teaching heresy uh, that Joel Beakey right now is teaching heresy. By the way, Piper um, that, Piper holds a reformed view on the Jews. Hmm. So I know he's premillennial. He's premillennial, but he's historic premillennial. He's not historic dispensation, yep. right? Which, right. by the way, the historic premillennial position was that all these great things are going to happen in the millennium, right? But that is going to be through and for the church. Hmm. They viewed yep. a thousand year period after the return of Christ of great blessing and um, grace manifest God's, God's presence through Christ here on the earth. But that was always in the church, the historic right. premillennial, right from the beginning. So that when we say premill versus postmill versus amill, the historic premill was not dispensational. Right. And right. when we say dispensational in this point, what we mean specifically is that the, the, the millennium would be um, a time where God would use the nation state of Israel again. Right. That was and, never and that in the picture. After a rapture. Until, like if you're yes. wondering, what are the main differences between historic premillennialism? Justin Martyr would be one of the yep. one of the yep. first. So if we're looking at a chronological order of church history, uh, historic premillennialism in my study that was the first that arrived on the scene. Mm -hmm. uh, then then second, there's a debate to be had if it was all male or post mill. Athanasius is pretty early on, um, and and some guys was well, he's just all male, and I would say that he's a patron saint of post mill. Right. And you know, there's an argument to be had. But the point is this: uh, historic premill did come first, and then shortly on the heels. We're not talking 500 years. We're talking, right. depending how you count, arguably between 70 and at max, maybe 140, right. 150 years. Um, uh, but but still very early on, all male and, and post male. So it's historic, not dispensationalism, but historic pre-male, then about within, at least within a, a century, give or take, 
Uh, you have all mill and post mill, and then you have uh, about eighteen, or at this point, it would be about uh, sixteen and a half centuries, right. where those are the only three positions. And then dispensationalism. Yep. And the main difference between dispensational premillennialism and historic premillennialism is exactly what Michael just said, plus the rapture. The rapture. Um, historic premillennialism, uh, uh, a, a secret rapture was absolutely foreign to the entire church until about 150 yep. years ago, um, 160, 170 years ago. Uh, no, no premillennial Christian until Darby and Schofield and, and these kinds of things in the mid uh, 19th century, 1800s, no uh, uh, premillennial, historic premillennial Christian for uh, 1,850 years spoke of a secret rapture. So the two main differences between dispensational, which is a modern novel phenomenon, dispensational premillennialism and historic premillennialism is one. Dispensationalism, that's where you get your left behind series. That's where you get a secret rapture. Historic premillennialism, there's not a, a, not a rapture. Not but, like that. But Joel, here's the and thing. And then two is... Oh, I'm is sorry is within dispensational premillennialism, it's this, uh, the millennium has uh, much to do with Israel, uh, the, this nation state of Israel. God special, God resumes his plan that right. he put on pause. Sacrifices for the are last, resumed, some Sacrifices resumed, temple rebuilt. And then historic premillennialism is there is a literal thousand year millennial kingdom on earth, um, but but it's uh, the, the church is in view and not Israel according to the flesh. So, so here's the thing, though, that is so interesting, because I, like a lot of us, dispensational, grew up that way. Um, the crux of the issue for, um, for the, dispens the development of dispensationalism, um, Darby kind of is the one who came up with the idea of Israel being the tool that God would use in the millennium. That was the first idea, and then he had to kind of go back and search, and then he came up with the idea of the rapture. Now, what's really interesting, this happened, like we said, in the mid-1800s. Second Great Awakening was going on. There was a time of kind of great religious zeal or cultic zeal. This is the time when um, Joseph Smith had his visions. This is the time when Ellen White had her visions and, and uh, started Seventh-day Adventism. Do you know the idea of Israel— being the tool that God would use in the millennium instead of the church came from a woman named Margaret McDonald, hmm. who it was known to have ecstatic trances in revival meetings. Right. And she had a two hour ecstatic trance where she was just mumbling things. And one of the things that she said was, God will use Israel in the millennium, hmm. not the church. And this was picked up by a preacher named um, Edward Irving. And he told that to Darby, and that idea stuck in Darby's mind, and it's that idea that made him go back and reread and then develop the rapture, the dispensations. But the whole idea of Israel being the tool of God in the millennium came from a two-hour ecstatic trance. Now, yep. that's not to say there have been visions and prophetic visions of the Lord in the past. That, that's, that's not the argument. The argument is that it's not biblical, in my view, right. but right. that's where it came from. Mm -hmm. yep. That's where the whole idea came from. It was yep. during a time too, so we think of the Zionism as a modern movement, the advocation of bringing in the dispersed Jews back into yep. the land. Yep. That movement was really gaining ground in the late 1800s. So you had Theodore Herzl would yep. be his name, and 1890 was the first time they actually convened in Switzerland yep. to begin to think about a plot of land in Palestine, and Jews had begun immigrating there until 1948, obviously, when they got the land back. But the point is that dispensationalism is, is rising and growing while you also have around it these streams of Zionism where Jews are looking forward to yep. getting some type of land back, staking out a plot here in the Middle East uh, that's theirs, that's going back to the land that's originally them. It didn't just happen just in this random context. Right. It was alongside all these other Zionist streams of thought. Right. And if you're wondering, well, how did all this take root in, uh, particularly in America? Right. Because it's it's not only dispensational premillennialism is a modern idea, recent idea, but it's it's, it's also an American, uniquely an American, American evangelical idea. evangelical idea. Right. And the mm -hmm. reason why is because, um, so so all the history you gave leading to Darby, and then eventually a guy named Schofield yep. came along and wrote, uh, uh, he didn't just publish, uh, you know, a Bible, a King James Bible, uh, but think like the MacArthur Study Bible. It was a study Bible that his, had his all these study notes. study Bible, though, was as a result of reading Darby's theological system. Exactly. That's my point. Yeah. So, so Schofield came and took Darby's system yep. 
um, and then wrote all of that in the margins. So he, right. he didn't just uh, have a Bible, but he had a particularly a study Bible. And so in all the margins, yeah. it's giving the you know alleged interpretations to all these texts, and all his interpretations are Darby's uh, wacky dispensational ideas. Right. And uh, and the Schofield Bible became incredibly popular, and it was like a household item. It's not yep. just that every American had a Bible; they had a Schofield Bible, and it took off. Yep. Um, and very quickly, that became uh, just the the dominant view. And still to this day, yep. uh, by God's grace, Reformed theology is making a resurgence. Um, and when I say Reformed theology, I don't just mean just uh, Calvinism. Calvinism, you know, mm. like soteriology, yeah. Yeah. Uh, God's sovereignty and salvation. But I mean, actual Reformed theology is making. Uh, a resurgence, uh, but up until very recently, like in the last 20 years, uh, the dominant view, and still to this day, yeah, even yeah, with yeah. a Reformed Covenant theology resurgence, even right now, this minute, the dominant view within evangelical Christianity in America is dispensational premillennialism. That is the dominant view. We are the minority. Hands down. We are the minority. Absolutely. So the, the average Christian today literally believes if if uh, if our nation gives billions of dollars to the nation state of Israel, we will be uh, right. we will uh, incur a, a, a spiritual um, and even physical financial blessing from God. There are uh, there is if <laughs> this is sad, but but statistically true. If your if your grandmother is still alive and she's mm. a Christian, um, there's probably about a 90% chance um, that, that she uh, believes that America um, and its prosperity, its financial blessing right. um, over, over the decades uh, is uh, in large part due to America's political alliance right. um, and mm. funding, financial funding from taxpayer dollars to the nation state of Israel. Uh, that, is, um, that is the dominant view it's just it's in the air like when when if you go to a christian and say um you know are, are you dispensationalist for most christians it would be like two fish swimming in the water um and one of them says hey the water sure is nice today and the other fish says what's water right yeah right like it, it's just assumed it's just yeah christians love the nation state of israel christians uh should should uh write checks to israel you know and and support every you know vote for every politician who's right. pro-israel pro -Israel, and yep. wants to send tax dollars to israel um and and that's just that is just the view that's just the view and it has been for a very long time um and when i say a very long time i mean 150 years, and in America, especially the last 75, But Joel, what's interesting years. about that, to get back to the Clavin clip, is he mentioned the priest who baptized, baptized him. Mm. And I can't think of a single denomination that has the officer of a priest that is dispensational. The Catholic Church is right. not dispensational. Right. Right. The Anglican, are they priests in the Anglican Church? That's what he claims yeah, to be, is Anglican. Uh -huh. Yeah, yep. yeah. They're, not, they're not dispensational. Right. And so it's, it's interesting yeah, to me... Is, is Anglican. ...that he is in a tradition that is not dispensational, but he's assuming that the correct perspective on Israel and on the Jews is the dispensational position. Right, yep. and I think a big part of that is because um, ethnically speaking, right, like as he said in the clip, he's Jewish. Right. And this is something that I've noticed um, that that is, it, it really is, um, it grieves me. Uh, but I, I know uh, uh, plenty, I've had plenty, pastorally, plenty of discussions with Christians uh, men who I really believe are Christians, so so uh, they they would they would have the same problems I have with the second half right. of Clavin's clip, the universalism. They they would say, yeah, that Clavin is in left field, you know, like that's absolutely wrong. They would say, no, there's no way to the Father but through Jesus Christ, His Son. But um, they are so they are Christians. Uh, they have a biblical confession of Christian faith, uh, but they are also ethnically Jewish, and uh, and that is still a really big deal for them. And so they would say, you know, they would say, I am, um, I'm a Jewish Christian, you know, right. whereas I like, I, I never go around saying I'm an Anglo Christian, mm -hmm. right. you yeah. know what I mean? Like, I, but they would say, I'm a Jewish Christian or a Messianic uh, Jew or, you know, yeah. or, and, and I do, I, I think that that is a dispensational hangover. I think that that yeah. comes from dispensation. What, what do you mean? You're a Jewish Christian. No, no, you just pick a lane. I mean, you're just to a, be, you're to a Christian. Fair, the, the, the early commentators on the book of Acts referred to Judeo-Christians, and what they meant was Jews who had converted to Christianity. Yes. And they continued to call them essentially Jewish Christians. Um, but when it, when it comes to really, I understand saying I'm a Chinese American, I still um, eat Chinese food, you know, I, I, I can't get away from the fact that that's the food my mom cooked for me. Right. That's, but to bring it into your religion, to me, is, is a different Right, thing. that's different. Yep. So, yep. so the Chinese American yep. is different because you're talking about two nations. Yep. 
right? So I am uh, like uh, from China is my uh, descent. That's my yep. heritage. That's yep. where I'm from. Um, my race, but my, even. But but where do I currently reside? Right. And where's my citizenship now? Right. Lie, uh, America. Right. So I'm a Chinese American. Right. But we're talking about two nations. Yep. But but over here we're talking about uh, nationhood or ethnicity mixed with um, mixed with faith. Right. I'm I'm a you know a, a Jewish Christian. Right. If some if somebody was born in the nation state of Israel and then moved over here and became a citizen of the United States and say I'm a Jewish American, fine. I I get that. Right. I get I get what you're saying. Uh, yep. You know, even then, I prefer just I'm an American, an American, <laughs> I'm an American. Oh, oh, with Jewish ancestry. Yeah, yeah. exactly. You know? right? Because I think wherever you yep. are, that's yep. where your allegiance should Agreed. should lie. And if your allegiance doesn't lie with America, and and you you know the place that you're from is so wonderful, then then feel free to go back. Right. That's you know that's just my, briefly my too take. on the nation state of Israel. I don't think we'll get back to it, but a lot of dispensationalists, I they have a lot of love for Israel. You have to understand that the nation state of Israel is not right. this conservative moral outlier in the Middle East. So the gayest city in the world is Tel Aviv, When you say Israel. gayest, you mean homosexual. I mean 200,000 yes. going to the biggest pride parade in the world yes. in Tel Aviv. You don't like the vaccine? Israel had the highest vaccination yep. rate of any nation. It was like, you have to have this. We are on lockdown. You need to get this vaccine. Uh, Israel Defense Force, the IDF, it's very well known that when they're fighting against Muslims, they'll blast pornography across their airwaves to demoralize those, ty- those fighters we saw a clip a couple months ago uh, of Orthodox Jews spitting on Christians as they walk through Jerusalem. So the point is not that Israel is the only nation in the world that's ever had pride parades, because Lord knows we have many of them. We're working to repent right. and get rid of those. Not the first nation to use immoral tactics in war, but but I would never, I think of Canada, for instance, and the regime going on there. I would never advocate sending billions of dollars to Canada. Right. I would never profess their love. I would never have the Canadian flag in my church. Uh, they hate me. They despise me. And I don't despise or have a very specific hate for them. And when but you I would say, say they, again, you know, we're not saying every single uh, Canadian citizen. Exactly. Because I'm sure that there's a great deal of them. We're like, I wish that I lived in America. Yep. Right. But we're but we're saying Canada as a nation, yes. represented by their elected officials, yes. exactly. hates the America. regime, the zeitgeist. Generally speaking, there's an animosity, right. especially towards a conservative Texas dwelling. Right. And so the point is for the dispensationalists has this love for Israel. They are a gay apostate, um, democratic. I don't really know so much. They're not your your homeboy. They're not this conservative bastion hanging out there in the Middle East. So don't think of them that way. And it's perf- perfectly permissible to say, yeah, uh, we don't need to support them. We don't need to send them billions of dollars. They wouldn't come to our aid. If we got attacked by Russia tomorrow. I don't think Israel would be the first one to say we're on our way. So, just yep. something I had to throw okay. out there. So three, so three main positions within. We've kind of hit the first one. What? We've kind of hit yeah, the yeah. First we've one. hit the first. Yeah. Yep. So the three main positions that are all orthodox. Again, hear me, listener. This does not mean that they're all true. Okay, because these positions uh, contradict one another. Um, so they're not all true. Only one of them could be right. None of them could be right. They could all be wrong, but they all can't be true. But what I'm saying when I say they're all orthodox is I mean um, that at least two of these positions are wrong, if not all three of them. Yep. But at least two of these positions are wrong, uh, but they are not so wrong that it uh, that is heresy. Right. Yep. Right. And and notice I I will um, I will show uh, much more charity than Jenna Ellis did. Um, I'm going to include on this list, so the first one that we've been talking about would be dispensationalism. Um, Dispensation, I believe, you guys, if you've been following this channel for a while, you know I'm not a big fan, okay? (laughs) Uh, I'll just leave it there, uh, to say the least, not a big fan. I think um, incalculable harm uh, to the Christian church and to our nation, because I think there are massive political ramifications to dispensationalism. Which, by the way, when we say uh, Christian nationalism and people get all up in arms— this country is religiously national. Right. We vote according to religious principles. Just look at how we fund Israel. Right. And the politicians exactly. who, who come out vocally for it. Right. It's a religious conviction. Absolutely. So um, I think dispensationalism has done a ton of harm. Okay. In the same way that I think continuationism, mm-hmm. especially this, uh, n- not all continuationists, but certain strands of continuationism that place a major emphasis on new revelation. Uh, New Testament prophecy being exercised by individuals in the church today, getting uh, extra biblical new revelation. Um, Yeah, I think new revelation, extra biblical revelation, uh, uh, it's not just that it's wrong, 
but it it does harm. harm. Bad theology, right? Yeah. Bad ideas have consequences. Bad theology has consequences, yes. right? We're not just ethereal creatures floating around in a spiritual plane. Um, your your views and your theology, what you believe about God and about the universe and your fellow man and the world and the way that it should function, of course that has an implication. To think anything else is, again, another right. example of bad theology known as pietism, right? So that, which has bad implications, yep. you know? And so, um, so my point is good theology has good fruit right. on the ground, right. not just good fruit when you're dead in heaven somewhere else, but good fruit here and now. Uh, bad theology consequently has bad fruit here and now. So I think dispensationalism has some really bad fruit. All that being said, still I'm categorizing dispensationalism um, in general, not every wacky you know strain of right, it, but right. in general underneath the banner of orthodoxy. I think it's wrong, but I'm not saying that it's heresy. Jenna right. Ellis did not do that courtesy. Um, right. she, she didn't say, hey, I think covenant theology is, is wrong. Um, but it is orthodox. No, she said covenant theology is replacement theology, um, and it is a heresy. Right. She she said, uh, she, she just flat out, what she's saying is um, R.C. Sproul, um, he wasn't wrong on this particular secondary theological issue. R.C. Sproul spent, um, spent 50 years publicly teaching heresy. Not a good look. Um, someone needs to take away her Twitter. Uh, so, you know, so, but here's the point. Dispensationalism, disagree with it, think there's harmful effects, but uh, that is one of the three positions that is orthodox. You could believe, in other words, you could believe that there is a secret rapture of the church in our future and that there is going to be a literal thousand year millennial reign of Christ reigning on earth, where he's going to do some unique things with Israel, fulfill certain land promises, the rebuilding of the third temple, uh, resuming animal sacrifices. Not all dispensationalists would agree on that, by the way. Some no. would be on, you know, on different sides. Yes, the animal sacrifices will resume, but as a, some guys, they, they would say they'll resume, but as a memorial, not to uh, mm. supplement. It's not to say that Christ's sacrifice as the Lamb of God is insufficient, um, and, and we need to make it up by, you know, it's Christ's sacrifice plus, a, you know, a few more bulls you know, on the third temple mount. Um, no, it's, uh, they would say it's a memorial looking back. It's, it's, it's uh, reminiscent, simply pointing back to the, the finished, sufficient, perfect sacrifice of Jesus that's already happened, um, you know, to be fair to the dispensationalists. And then some dispensationalists would say there aren't going to be animal sacrifices. But the point is, in general, dispensationalists would say secret rapture of the church, um, that's going to be before seven-year tribulation or in the middle of that, that tribulation or at the end of it, and then a thousand-year uh, physical reign of Christ on earth where he resumes, uh, all of a sudden he pushed pause in AD 70, and, it, and there's, we've been on pause uh, because Israel rejected their Messiah. We've been on pause for about uh, uh, 1,950 years, but then he'll, he'll push play again and pick back up the narrative that he was doing with Israel and this uh, this B narrative that he's been doing, you know, in the intermittent period for 19 and a half centuries with the church. Uh, that'll be done. The church is raptured up and then he'll resume for a thousand more years with Israel where he'll fulfill both land promises and spiritual promises right. of a revival among Israel. That's yeah. dispensationalism. Again, I think it's bad theology. I think bad theology has consequences. It doesn't just stay in the ivory tower, but it actually has negative effects, political effects. I think it's it's hurt America. I think it's hurt churches, all that, but it is not a heresy. It still falls under the banner of orthodoxy. I'm not prepared uh, this afternoon to say that John MacArthur is right. a heretic. <laughs> I'm just not prepared to say that. Nope. Uh, I think he's wrong. And, and I really think he's wrong, yeah. um, but I don't think that he's a heretic. All right. So that's number one, uh, dispensationalism. Number two, soft supersessionism. Soft supersessionism in a nutshell, dispensationalism, this is how you break it down. Dispensationalism would say, yes, that there are future land promises for Israel, uh, ethnic Israel, the nation state of Israel, and yes, there's a future revival. So future land promises for Israel and uh, future um, uh, revival. So uh, both physical and spiritual. Physical uh, future promises for Israel still in their future, yet to be fulfilled, and future spiritual promises to be fulfilled for Israel, namely um, a mass revival among uh, um, uh, Jewish people, according to the flesh, that they would come to Christ. Uh, that's dispensationalism. Future land, future revival, future well, and physical, and the future people of God. Physical, yep. right? And and that they are. Uh, what? They still are God's chosen right, people. That they're still God's yep. chosen people. Uh -huh, he's not done. Yes. Um, and he's going to push play again, even though it's been on pause for, for 19 and a half centuries. Um, soft supersessionism would say no to future land promises. They'd say all that has been fulfilled. 
Um, uh, but yes to uh, future revival. So no on the physical promises, but yes on the future spiritual promises. And when we say revival, we we mean to Christ. To Christ, yep. yes. Yeah. Romans not, 11. Not that they would become uh, better uh, with Judaism. Right. No, they, they, they would forsake Talmudic Judaism, yeah. and that they would turn or to the Old Lord Testament Jesus Judaism, Christ. Like, or Old Testament yes, Judaism. Yes, they're turning to Christ. And that's a good point to make also. Talmudic Judaism, yes. modern Judaism, um, is not... Um, uh, synonymous. It's not just that it's the Old Testament minus the New. Right. No, it is a a, a uh, vast perversion of the Old Testament. Yeah. Um, so Judaism, according to the Old Testament, under Moses, um, was good and fulfilled in Christ. Correct. Uh, at the coming of Christ, at his time, they already, the, the religious rulers of the day, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the, the, the lawyers and religious rulers, they were already had twisted and perverted uh, Judaism as given to Moses. Right. Uh, so far that, that Jesus um, it, it, again and again is saying, uh, you have heard it is said, but I tell you. And when he says, I tell you, he's not saying Moses said this, but I tell you that. No, he's saying Moses said this, and this is what Moses was right. And this is what that means. And what you've been said yes. is a perversion of Moses. It's, it's not that uh, Jesus is coming and saying, uh, Moses is wrong and I'm right. Right. No, yep. Jesus is coming, and he's going back to Moses and saying, Moses has been twisted by the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Moses has been perverted, um, and I'm coming to come back and tell you this is uh, what Moses really said, and here's its highest fulfillment, which finds it, its its highest fulfillment in me, right. yep. in Christ. Um, and so, in other words, uh, by, the, by time, in the first century, by the time that Jesus came uh, in his earthly ministry, Judaism had already derailed. It had already been massively perverted. And here's the deal. Um, if the Pharisees in the first century, right. who Jesus said, you've perverted religion, yep. you've perverted true religion that was given to Moses. This isn't Judaism. This is a perverted uh, Judaism. If the Pharisees in the first century in Jesus' day who perverted Judaism saw Talmudic Judaism in this day, right. they would be uh, shocked. They <laughs> yeah. would say, all right, now we were all for twisting scripture. <laughs> but guys, this is Come way on. too far. This is, even we want to do this, yeah, yeah. right? And so, um, that so it's important to know it, it. Talmudic Judaism, modern Judaism today, is not Old Testament. And they're just missing the new. Right. No, it's Old Testament that was perverted and and greatly perverted by the time Jesus came, and then for two thousand years has been far more perverted. And that's what you have with modern Judaism today. So again, dispensationalism is saying there are still future physical promises for Israel and spiritual promises for Israel, and the spiritual promise being a revival, not a revival of Judaism, but a forsaking of Talmudic Judaism, and a, revi a Christian revival right. where uh, Jews, according to the flesh, uh, embrace their Messiah and come to Christ, come to Christian faith, yeah. all right? That's dispensationalism. Soft supersessionism would say no to the land, the physical promises, but yes to the future spiritual promises, the, the Christian revival. So there is a future Christian revival uh, for Israel, um, according to the flesh, uh, but there's not a future land promise. In other words, um, a covenant theologian like R.C. Sproul, since I've already used him as an example, who would be a soft supersessionist, um, R.C. Sproul, uh, if he were here, he would say, yeah, if the nation state of Israel ended tomorrow, uh, it w I, I wouldn't lose any sleep. It would not mess with my theology. It would not I, I, right. it, have some big upheaval. I would still believe uh, that there are ethnic Jews, according to the flesh, now dispersed and scattered as they have been in previous times, and that for them, there is still in their future a mass spiritual revival where many of them, even the majority of them, uh, will bow the knee to Christ and come to him in saving faith. Right. That's what Sproul would say. Um, but he would say, but none of that uh, is dependent on a uh, third temple being built. None of that is dependent on Israel even maintaining um, its nation state and, and the land that it currently resides in. Uh, none of that is, uh, all the physical stuff and, right. and, and political stuff is not um, a prerequisite for the spiritual revival. And so he would say spiritual revival for Israel in, in, in our future, Israel according to the flesh, being saved and coming to Christ, yes. Uh, the land stuff, no, right. no. Um, and, and so that's that's the soft supersessionist view, which is thoroughly orthodox. And then a full supersessionism, this is the view that many Christians are not aware of, um, but but you should be, because it is a viable orthodox view. I'm not saying you have to hold it, uh, but it would be one of the, these three main views that is absolutely, um, absolutely orthodox. The full supersessionism would say no to future land promises 
and no to a future revival, a future spiritual promise, and not, just like with the land, not because God changed his mind, not because God broke his promise, but because it's already been fulfilled. God promised land, and he granted it, and then Israel lost it. Yep. But read the end of Joshua. All the land promised to Israel through Moses, God did it. He did yeah. it. And then Israel got spewed out of the land. Um, and then same with uh, this uh, future spiritual revival, the full supersessionism view. What they would say is that uh, when Paul's writing Romans 11, that's the main text. So Romans 11 says uh, that Israel, that a partial hardening has come over Israel uh, and that they have been cut off because of the rejection of the Messiah. They've been cut off. And Paul even says it. I will, I'm going to be the apostle to the Gentiles because I, I keep going to the Jews. They keep rejecting me. They're the ones who are persecuting me by and large. Um, and, and yes, they use the Romans to do it because they have to because they're under Roman rule. So they, they legally do not have uh, the, the political power. Uh, the Jews couldn't kill someone, right? That's why they went to Rome to have, uh, to have Pilate do it. They, it was not lawful for them uh, to crucify Jesus. But, but Pilate makes it very clear. He, now, he folds like a cheap suit, and, and he is morally responsible for that. He tries to wash his hands, but, but in the uh, ultimate um, eternal sense, Pilate did, did not wipe that guilt off of his hands. Pilate is guilty for the choice that he made. Pilate's own wife is tormented by visions right. and saying, please, yeah. Pilate, don't kill this guy. Don't do it. Absolve yourself. But Pilate's up for real election. He's your typical politician. Uh, the Jews in his province, you know, they have they have some clout. It's Passover. And wait, the it, tensions yep. are high. He yep. doesn't want to upset them, yep. and so he folds. But notice, here's the deal. Uh, the Jews are the ones who want to kill Jesus. Pilate doesn't. The Romans don't want to kill Jesus in this instance. The Jews want to kill them, uh, kill him, but the Jews can't. They, they Because the Jews are not a sovereign state. They're a province underneath the empire of Rome. And so they have to have uh, the, the, the Roman uh, approval. The, the Romans are, are yep. the ones who drive the nails through Jesus' hands. The Romans are the ones who drive the nails through his feet and, and hoist him up on the cross. So it is true to say the Romans, in the physical, literal sense, killed Jesus. Um, but they would not have killed Jesus if it was not for the Jews uh, screaming, crucify him. And hold crucify on to that. Him. We're going to get to it later. Crucify it matters. It's right. a matter of biblical truth. Right, and and they even say, Pilate says, my, let my hands be clean. Um, yeah. And the Jews say, well, uh, let his blood be on us and our children. Yeah, Us and our children. Uh, they say, we're, we're happy, happy to take this, this guilt. And then later on in Acts chapter two in Pentecost, you know, Peter stands up and says to the Jews, that's yeah. the context. It's in Jerusalem. And in this chapter starts with him saying, uh, the chapter starts that he stands up to all the men and leaders in Israel. And he says, this Jesus whom oh, you killed, killed yeah. whom you crucified. Um, and it's not just a generic, I know we would say, well, all humanity killed Jesus. Yes, but, but we can speak in many different senses here, right? So um, in the spiritual sense, eternal sense, and ultimate, because this is the highest and truest sense, we all killed Jesus. Yeah, I killed Jesus. Uh, my sin, it was my sin that nailed him there. Yeah, Absolutely. That I am able to look to the cross and say, um, I did that. My sin uh, killed Jesus. And so the, in the highest ultimate sense, all of humanity by our sin killed Jesus because Jesus, this is true. He says, no man takes my life right. from me, but I, I freely lay it, lay it down. And why did he lay it down? He laid it down um, in obedience to his father and to ransom for himself um, a sinful people from every tribe committed cosmic treason and sinned against him. Not just the Jews, yep. but everyone. So in one sense, in the highest sense, in the spiritual and eternal sense, we all killed Jesus. Well, you know what? Actually, in the highest sense, Jesus gave his life. No yeah. one kills Jesus. Yeah, right. Okay? He lays it down. Uh, and then in a, a salvific sense, soteriology sense, um, Jesus, it was necessary that Jesus died because of all people, not just one people group, all people, because all have sinned and fallen short right. of the glory of God. Uh, and then in a literal physical sense, who actually put the nails in his hands and feet? Right. The, the, the Romans did. Um, but in the, um, in the historic um, and social um, political sense, who is saying, uh, is there just, is it just everybody from uh, all over the known world? No, it is one particular group of people who want him dead. And it is, that is the Jews. Yep. And that's, that's perfectly biblical to say. Multiple layers there. All those statements are true statements. Those, those statements are different statements, but, um, but that's not relativism because they're not contradicting statements. Exactly. They're all true. Like when Paul talks about Hagar and Sarah, he says, um, this can also be understood 
allegorically. Right. So he's not saying uh, the allegory against the literal, um, uh, the literal hi historic hermeneutic. He's saying um, alongside, in addition to. So understand it historically, literally, and allegorically. Right. So uh, in the higher level, we all kill Jesus by our sin. In the highest level, n nobody kills Jesus. He he lays his life down. No one takes his life. Uh, but at a lower level, in the physical, literal sense, the Romans drove the nails through his hands and feet. And uh, in the political, historical, social sense, uh, it was the Jews shouting, crucify him. So um, all that being said, the point is Romans 11. <laughs> Get back. Almost done. Romans 11. Um that's where we find, Paul says, Israel, because of the rejection of the Messiah, and Paul now has, has, has uh, uh, found that, that it is God's uh, will for him to be an apostle to the Gentiles because the Jews have rejected his apostolic ministry just as they rejected Christ. And Paul is now saying that Israel, according to the flesh, the state, the nation of Israel has been cut off for a time, um, and that they, the partial hardening um, has, has, you know, they've been partially blinded and partially hardened their hearts. Um, so that he's going to the Gentiles. The Gentiles are flooding in. Gentiles are hearing the gospel preaching of Paul the apostle and being saved by the thousands. They're, they're flowing in. All over the known world. <clears throat> All over the known world. Uh, but the Jews doesn't mean every single one of them. Partial hardening, meaning an individual Jewish person. Um, there were some individuals who were saved under Paul's preaching. And, but, uh, but by and large, in a general sense, Israel hardened, Gentiles being drawn. But Paul says uh, the Gentiles have been grafted in. Israel has been cut off so that uh, the Gentiles might be grafted in, but eventually Israel will be grafted back in also. Well, this, this full supersessionism view is not saying, and Romans 11, uh, God changed his mind and God failed and he didn't do it. No, full supersessionism is the view uh, that God did fulfill this Romans 11 promise of a spiritual, not land promises, physical promises, but a spiritual revival salvation promise for Israel, according to the flesh, aka a bunch of, of physical Jewish people came to Christ and repented and got saved. The full supersessionist view is saying that that's not a promise that God denied or failed to keep, but that it was fulfilled in Paul's at the future in the future of Paul at the time of his writing of Romans 11, but in our past, yep. because it's, it's been 2,000 years. So when Paul was writing the book of Romans, um, this was before AD 70. And there are guys like James B. Jordan would be one example, uh, but there are guys who, who hold this view uh, that, that Paul writes this, that Israel will be saved, and that this is not something still hanging over in our future 2,000 years later, but that this is something that actually through Paul's ministry, that, that his uh, brothers according to the flesh, his kinsmen according to the flesh, fellow Israelites, actually were roused to a divine godly sense of jealousy because they saw all of these covenant promises that were historically theirs all of a sudden being received by Gentiles and Samaritans and all these other people from Ethiopians and, and, and all these other people are being blessed and God is lavishing his promises upon them and, and Israel is being further and further judged and all this leads up to Titus sacking um, Rome and Jerusalem and, and the fall of Jerusalem, the fall of the temple. And, and so the, the view of full supersessionism is that through the ministry of the apostle Paul and the other apostles, um, that, that uh, Israel actually was roused to jealousy and that they were progressively and then especially kind of a catalyst ramping up um, in, in AD 70 to the judgment that fell upon uh, Jerusalem the, and the destruction of the temple and the destruction of the city, um, that, that people, that the, the Jewish people, they saw this and they remembered because they were there. They remember the words of Jesus in the Olivet Discourse in Matthew 24, where Jesus says, this generation, will not pass away until all these things come to pass. And what are some of the things that he just said would happen? Not right. one stone left on another of the temple, that the temple would be destroyed. And so, and then these people, they shout, crucify him. And so then Jesus dies, he's crucified. And then, and then exactly like he said, uh, now 80, 70, within 40 years, which is one generation in Jewish in Jewish terminology, that's one generation, exactly what Jesus said. It's now been, uh, th th there's still many people who are, are very elderly now, they're old, but they're still alive. They remember what Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse, and they just saw the temple, exactly like Jesus prophesied, uh, destroyed, not one stone left on another. They were there that day shouting in the crowd, crucify him, and they come to their senses 
uh, with the the uh, the move of the Holy Spirit, and they realize we crucified the Messiah. He was right. He wasn't a false prophet. Yeah. That was him. Lord, forgive me. And they come to saving faith. And that's Romans 11. Romans 11 was written before AD 70. So when Paul writes, this will happen in the future, uh, AD 70 was in the future for Paul writing Romans 11. That would be the, the full supersessionist view. So again, last, last little recap. Dispensationalism, they would say there's still future land promises and future uh, spiritual promises for Israel. Soft supersessionism would say no future land promises, but there is a future revival, future spiritual promises. Full supersessionism would say no future land promises and no future revival. There was a future revival at the time of the writing of Romans 11, but not in our future, 2,000 years now removed. That God, uh, and not because God changed his mind or God failed to keep that promise, he actually fulfilled it. And, and the majority of Israel, according to the flesh, actually did come to saving faith in Jesus Christ um, uh, through the ministry of the latter years of, of this interim period between Christ, his death, resurrection, and ascension, and the fall of Jerusalem in AD 70. And then many who were not yet converted in AD 70, when this judgment does come, a physical judgment comes upon Jerusalem, they see it as a fulfillment of Christ's own words, his own prophecies in the Olivet Discourse. They repent of their sins, and they come to saving faith in Jesus. And now... And it's fulfills done. too. Malachi 3 and 4, the prophecy was, I'm going to visit you nearby for judgment, but to the one who fears my name, the son of righteousness will rise with healing in his wings. So God comes to the temple and visits judgment upon the Jewish people, but to those who fear the name of Christ, he says, you're going to go out like calves, skipping from the stall. So Romans chapter 11 fulfilled there, and Malachi 3 and 4, the end of the Old Testament, it closes with the expectation, John the Baptist is coming, and then I'm going to visit you for judgment. But to those of you who fear my name, the sun, S-U-N, of righteousness will rise, and you're going to go out and be free. Hmm. So the whole Old Testament, too, is building up to covenant judgment, but for those who fear the name of God, freedom and salvation. Amen. Amen. So the point is, none of those views are heresy, uh, and none of them are anti-Semitic. They're not... Well, okay, before you, before you tie the knot with that anti-Semitic thing, I just want to stress... The idea that ethnic Israel is not God's chosen people currently is the predominant view in church history. Hmm. I think a lot of people who grew up in American churches just don't know that. I did not know that, right? The reformers, the early church fathers, I mean, it's, it, you don't find it anywhere in church history. And so like you're fond of saying, Joel, maybe, maybe they were all wrong that whole time and... Darby finally got it right. <laughs> or maybe they were right. Maybe they were onto something and we we have just missed something in our American modern Christianity. And Christians have to reckon with church history. I'm not saying you have to be covenantal or hold the reform position, but you have to reckon with the fact that the giants of the faith, the titans of the faith, viewed Israel and the church in this way. Mm-hmm. Calvin Knox, you have them here yeah. in your article. Zwingli, John Augustine, Gill. I mean, it goes, it goes all the way back. It yep. goes all the way back. Mm -hmm. yep. They all believe this. Right. So uh, what Clavin says in that clip, Nathan, let, let's back it up and just show the first half one more time. And then we'll land, we'll land the plane on this first point, and then we'll tackle the universalism. Can you go ahead? You know, when I did this, by the way, the priest who baptized me said, you know, Christians won't accept you. They'll, you'll still be a Jew. And I said, well, I am. A, that's my race. I'm a Jew. I'm proud of my race. It's a, it's a great race. It's done many, many great things, including write the Bible. And, you know, I am a Jew. But that hasn't happened at all. Christians have welcomed me with open arms, except this Christ the King, anti-Semitic crowd. Christ is the King. And one day, every knee will bow and recognize it because he's not just my king, he's king of the universe. But when you use that phrase to mean that God has abandoned his chosen people, the Jews, through whom he came into this world incarnate, and that he's broken his promises, his covenant with the Jews, you are quoting scripture like Satan does in the Bible. You are quoting scripture to your purposes, and that to me is specifically wicked you know stop it when you yeah he andrew clavin exactly not essentially i want to say essentially but it's not essentially he exactly explicitly uh just condemned covenant theology 
the, uh, the reigning Orthodox position for 2,000 years of church history, of the Christian church. He condemned it as uh, twisting scripture like Satan in the wilderness to tempt Jesus. So satanic, wicked, and anti-Semitic. Again, that, that's my whole point on all of this. Uh, Andrew Claven doesn't say Christ the king crowd. is saying Christ is king and therefore death to Israel. Right. No. Right. Yeah, that's anti-Semitic. Of course that is. Right? They're not, uh, he, he doesn't say, uh, people are saying Christ is king with their memes on Twitter and then, and then saying, you know, uh, uh, commit genocide of Israel, you know, and, but no. No, he literally says, right. Claven literally says in that clip, um, this Christ the King crowd, this anti-Semitic crowd that's being satanic, twisting scripture like Satan did in the wilderness, and wicked. So this, this anti-Semitic, satanic, wicked, Christ the King crowd is doing what? What's your example? Uh, saying that God has broken his, his covenant with the, uh, the nation state of Israel. That is not anti-Semitism. That is not wicked, and that is not satanic. That is, um, that is a, a perfectly orthodox position. And I'm just trying to be charitable here in, in throwing a bone to the dispensationalists, you know, and, and saying you are brothers in Christ. I think you're terribly wrong, but brothers in Christ. But it, it's not just the orthodox position. Yeah. It is the reigning supreme position yeah. throughout church history for 1,850 years is covenant theology, and it's not, and look, this is the, the, the subtle, it, and it's, it's deceptive. And, and, and to be as charitable as possible, maybe it's just theological ignorance. Right. But he says, broken. And see, that's what dispensationalists do. That, that's what they do all the time. You believe God broke his promises. Right. No, 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 now, nobody now, said that. Now, now he's saying we are impugning God. Right. With with faithlessness. With faithlessness to his covenant. They, yep. Exactly. That we're indicting God, accusing God of breaking his promises, breaking his covenant, failing to keep it. God couldn't keep his covenant or wouldn't keep his covenant. No, no, no. That is not covenant theology. Right. That is not the position. The position, and again, it is the dominant supreme position throughout 2,000 years of church history until very recently. The position is not that God broke his promises. The position is that God fulfilled his promises and that these promises are no longer in our future. They were, they were future promises at the timing of the writing of the New Testament, but they're not still future promises in 2024, right? That God promised that he would bring his people into a land flowing with milk and honey, and he did it. He didn't yep. break his promise. He fulfilled it. And then Israel, by their faithlessness... Right lost it. And God also promised that Israel, uh, through the Apostle Paul, he promised in Romans 11, this is an apostolic prophecy, that he will save Israel according to the flesh. There will be a mass revival, spiritual revival of Israel forsaking Judaism and coming to Christian faith, coming to the Messiah, and that this will happen to Israel according to the flesh, that they will become true Israel according to the promise. Right. right. That they'll be grafted right. in alongside the Gentiles, that they'll be grafted in to this great um, Christian promise, this spiritual promise of, of faith in Christ and union with him. He's the vine, we're the branches. Um, and that, you can believe, is a promise still to be fulfilled in our future, as R.C. Sproul believed, and as many uh, covenant theologians today believe. Um, or you can believe that even that spiritual promise has been, it was a, a future promise at the timing of the writing of Romans 11 in Paul's future, but it's actually in our past, it was fulfilled in AD 70, that that too has been fulfilled, that a bunch of, of, of Israel, the majority of Israel, according to the flesh, did come to saving faith in Christ. And, uh, and that's a view that certain individuals like James B. Jordan hold that is uh, also perfectly orthodox and appropriate to hold. And in that case, if you're in that position, you would be saying um, that Israel does not have a divine right to land. It doesn't. And neither does America or any other nation, for that matter. It does not have a divine right to physical land promises. And there's not a future spiritual promise. That has already been fulfilled. So then what does Israel have as a nation state? They have the same promise that every uh, country has. Yeah. Uh, the great post-millennial, if you're post-millennial, right. see, here's the beauty of being post-millennial. Um, 
then they have the same promise that every nation has, that the nations are Christ's inheritance, right? The Psalms say, ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance. The son has indeed asked and one by one, gradually uh, um, and progressively throughout this gospel age, uh, the mustard seed uh, growing to a great tree, the, 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 the leaven working gradually through the whole lump of dough, that the nations are flocking to Mount Zion, who is Christ in the spiritual ultimate sense, um, and that every nation will be saved, and, and Israel, being a nation state, would be counted among the nations, just like Brazil and China and the Sudan and Canada and New Zealand and every other nation, um, and that they don't have any special promise beyond that that they will be saved just like Canada will be saved and New Zealand will be saved and America will be saved. Um, that, and that's it. Um, but what Clavin wants you to believe, and this is a dispensational view, he wants you to believe that that's not enough and, and that if you have that view, you say, I think Israel will be saved eventually in a great post-millennial hope as all the nations of the world will be saved. Um, but I don't believe that right now, today, that there is any special sense about Israel, the nation of Israel, um, that, that makes them special in the sight of God above any other nation. Uh, Clavin wants you to think that that's, um, that that's anti-Semitism right. yep. and that it's wicked and satanic. And Jenna Ellis would, would uh, second him and right. say that it's heresy. Um, and I just want you to know, listener, um, that Clavin is wrong. Jenna Ellis is wrong. Um, that, that is... Uh, that's terrible. That is absolutely terrible to uh, to take the vast, uh, all the reformers, all the Puritans, and the vast majority of Christians throughout 2,000 years of church history and call them all heretics because they all were covenant theologians. None of them were dispensationalists. Um, that that is absolutely uh, ridiculous. And so uh, the, the last thing that, that that you know I think is important on, on this point is well if you believe that that there's no future land promises or a future spiritual revival because that happened in AD seventy, um, then you know uh, do do you believe what what do you think you know the nation state of Israel is today you know like uh, and and what I would say is uh, that the nation state of Israel today is a legitimate sovereign nation like any other nation in the world. Here's the deal. This is the way God's sovereignty works, okay? And this is the way politics and nations and ethics works, okay? Let me, let me use an illustration of, of marriage. Uh, if a man divorces his wife without biblical cause, meaning there is not infidelity and there was not abandonment, he just, you know, he just didn't like the way that she uh, burnt the toast, <laughs> right? He was a wicked man, yep. sin, and he left his wife and ended his, his marriage covenant, and, and then remarried another woman, and then was to be converted, and came to Christian faith, right. and then came to our church, uh, and, and we welcomed him into membership, because he had a biblical profession, he acknowledged that what he did in the past was sin, he's repented of that sin, and he comes to church with his second wife, who he's now married to, but he's, he's so convicted over his past life yep. and his past sin. He says, Pastor, I don't know what to, should I divorce my, my current wife and go back to my first wife because I shouldn't have ever divorced right. her? I didn't have biblical cause. What, what is the pastoral, biblical, right. correct, accurate, accurate answer? Do I say, oh yeah, you're right. You did, it's true. You did not have biblical cause for divorcing your first wife because there wasn't infidelity, there wasn't abandonment. You just didn't like her and you were a wicked man and you did a wicked thing by divorcing her. And so therefore you should divorce your current wife, your second wife and go back and marry her. No. I would say uh, each right. man, this is uh, 1 Corinthians 7, each man should remain in whatever station of life he's in when the Lord calls him. Right. That's what Paul says. Um, no, what, what you did was wrong. So it was, it was uh, completely in contradiction to God's moral will, divorcing your wife without biblical cause, but it was still within, as all things are, his sovereign. Right. Because nothing happens by accident. And so within God's sovereignty, so you sinned and you're culpable for that sin, but there's forgiveness in Christ, when there's confession of sin and repentance, and and you now, um, although you sinned, I uh, ed in the past tense, you are not currently in an ongoing continual state of sin. Yeah. So now bring that to Israel. There are some who would say, "Well, I don't know if the origins of the nation state of Israel back in the 1940s, if that should have happened." I'm not going to give you my view on that. Okay. So if you're looking forward to that, that's just not going to happen today. All right, um, but here's the deal. There's a debate to be had. There's good points to be made on both sides. But here's the point. 
it doesn't matter. Um, so let's say that it was all just a cabal. It was all, you know, nefarious purposes and it was wrong and it was unethical and, and it went against just war theory and it went against this and it went against that. And it was all against God's revealed moral will that Israel uh, got that land in the 1940s and became a nation state. Okay, sure. Um, even if that's the case, uh, the question is today, they're a nation state. And it's the same thing as the marriage situation. They are a nation today. Yep. Like it or not. Uh, whether whether the way that came about was was uh, biblical and ethical or not, they are a nation today. And here's my point. As a nation today, they have the right to police their borders. They have the right to a military and they have the right to defense. So, so back to the anti-Semitism thing, even if you're a full supersessionist right. and you say there's no divine right to the land, not a divine right to the land, just like there's not, America doesn't have a divine right to this land. There's no divine right to the land and there's no future spiritual revival because that already happened in 8070. Even the full supersessionist would still be able to say, but in the providence and sovereignty yeah. of God, whether it was moral or not, God still sovereignly established the nation state of Israel, just like he sovereignly established Brazil and China and Canada and you know, fill in the blank, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, they are a legitimate nation state today. Whether the way that happened was legitimate or not doesn't matter. Providentially, as it pertains to today, as it currently rests, they are a legitimate nation state. They have a right to borders, a right to citizens, uh, uh, citizenship, a right to uh, a military, and a right to defense. And, uh, and therefore, I support Israel, as I do any nation, their, uh, their right to defend their country from uh, enemies, both um, foreign and domestic. And yet... Um, I do not believe that America uh, has uh, an obligation, a biblical, spiritual, moral right. obligation right. to uh, fund them in their defense. They, uh, so I support the nation state of Israel, uh, that they're a legitimate nation, whether they were legitimately contrived or not. They are a legitimate nation today. They have a legitimate military, and they legitimately are uh, have the ethical um, permissibility under God to defend their nation. And their neighbors are savages too. Hamas and, yep. and Palestine, they are not the neighbors that you want in their side. So right. they absolutely should put up some walls, have yep. a border, and the right to protect it. Right. And, and you're also and not we're saying... we're supporting that while saying, but I don't believe that they are still in a, a unique covenant with God. Right. And they don't have a divine right no. to the land. So if somebody else kicked them out and 75 more years went past, I'd say the same thing about this new nation that I'm saying right now about Israel. Right. Because exactly. it's not eternally, indefinitely their right. land. That's what I mean. Right. Just like America isn't indefinitely our land. And Canada is not indefinitely. That's what I mean. So do they have a right to the land right now? Yes. Are they a legitimate nation right now? Yes. Um, and, and do I support Israel, their people, defending their borders and their nation against their enemies? Yep. yep. Mm -hmm. But I can say all that without saying they have a divine land promise and without even saying that they have a future spiritual revival other than the general spiritual revival that all nations have, because I'm post-millennial and I believe all nations will come to Christ. And, um, and therefore, America, it may or may not be politically advantageous for That's, us to support them and to have them as allies. And currently, I don't believe it is. And yeah. none of that is anti-Semitic. And Andrew Claven would have you believe that that is anti-Semitic. Yeah. Andrew Claven does not, again, in that clip, he does not say uh, the Christ is king crowd is wishing death upon uh, every Jew. No, he, uh, and therefore they're anti-Semitic, twisting scripture like Satan and wicked. No, he says the Christ is king crowd that's anti-Semitic, satanic and wicked is the crowd uh, that uh, simply is not Zionist. And brothers and sisters listening, you do not have to be a Zionist to not be anti-Semitic, right? If you're watching this for a visual, if this is anti-Semitism and this over here is Zionism, there's a lot of room in between. Yeah. That's my point. That's my point. It's not that there are, it's not a razor and there are only two sides that you're either Zionist or an anti-Semite. That is baloney. Yeah. That is, that is propaganda. That's political weaponized uh, tactics to, to silence freedom of speech. And I reject it. Christ is king and I'm not a Zionist. Christ is king and I'm also not anti-Semitic. Not crazy. Any, anything you guys want to add to that? 
No, it's good. I think we'll hit a commercial right. break and come right Commercials, back. and then we'll show that last, uh, the universalism part of Clavin. The danger of centralized power is often represented by the word king. As Americans, we hate the word king. Civilian ownership of body armor is about helping people to have increased power to resist tyrants and criminals. And so, Armored Republic is about helping you to preserve your God-given rights to the honor of the Lord Jesus Christ because he is the king of kings and he governs kings and he will judge them. This is Armored Republic and in a republic, there is no king but Christ. We are free craftsmen and we are honored to be your armor spread of choice. Are you a Christian struggling to find companies that align with your values and beliefs? Well, then Squirrely Joe's has you covered for all your coffee needs. All of their coffee is hand-selected and roasted fresh every day by a family of fellow believers. Try them out and you'll savor exceptional coffee while knowing that your investment supports a company committed to following God's teachings and upholding truth and righteousness, ensuring that your hard-earned money contributes to the growth of God's kingdom. So head on over to squirrelyjoes.com forward slash right response. Enter promo code RRM at checkout for 20% off your purchase. All right. Well, welcome back. Uh, to bring this to right now, literally right now, why does this matter? Why does an understanding of Israel and the Jewish people, uh, how is it playing out? In South Dakota, um, so this would be Republican Governor Kristi Noem. Notice I did not say conservative. Republican Governor Kristi Noem recently signed House Bill 1706. House Bill 1706, it adds a category of discrimination, and that category of discrimination uses what's called the International Holocaust Remembrance alliances, definitions of anti-Semitism. So now there's a new protected category in the state of South Dakota. Is this law now? This is law. Oh, she okay. signed this. This isn't just a bill that someone put forward or even an executive order. This was passed by both houses, by Senate and by House. Law now in South Dakota. There are protected categories against discrimination. So me being late for work and getting fired, not a protected category. <laughs> uh, getting fired for being white, well, decreasingly so now. That's not that would be a protected category, protected category of sex or race or disability. So in South Dakota, there's the addition now, the adoption of these European Union style definitions of anti-Semitism. And some of the definitions in there, uh, Nate, you can actually show the image of it. One of the definitions in there of among other speech, among other rhetoric, is using symbols and images associated with cl classical anti-Semitism, for example, claims of Jews killing Jesus or blood libel to characterize Israel or Israelis. Mm -hmm. So in this law that's been signed in that adds new categories of discrimination here in the United States, this month, this was just signed, there has now been added EU-style regulations that say, if you say the Jews killed Jesus, we're just talking about this, that certainly there's a sense where our sins are what put Jesus on the cross. But here's the deal. That's not the truth that's under fire. Nobody right. cares if you confess yeah. that. What's under fire right now is the truth uh, that the people in the first century cried out for the blood of Jesus and put him to death. And here in the United States now, if in, you are in South Dakota and you say that, maybe you have an employee or a student or someone in your church that is Jewish, and then maybe later on they were let go or fired, they could come to the state and say, I was discriminated against because he affirmed basic biblical truth. And what we'll always see too is this definition expands. So right now it's the Jews killed Jesus. What will it be in two years? We talked about Christ is King, for example. Christ is Lord. Jesus is the Messiah. These laws never stay where they are. They always expand to greater and greater protection of the ruling class. Just today, in Texas, Governor Greg Abbott signed an executive order that at Texas universities, so at Texas colleges, um, he is cracking down on anti-Semitic speech, anti-Semitic actions. Now, certainly... Read the tweet real quick, Wes. Oh, right. It's right there. Anti-Semitism will not be tolerated in Texas. Today, I issued an executive order to fight the increase in acts of anti-Semitism at Texas colleges and universities. Texas stands with our Jewish students. We will ensure our college campuses are safe space for the Jewish community. Now, most certainly, nobody should be threatened on the right of class. Right. We already have those laws. Threatening, violence, 
any of those different things for any reason is already outlawed. And he notes that in the more expanded version of the executive order he signed, that they're going to be looking into what the appropriate punishment is for anti-Semitic rhetoric. And as a Christian, you need to understand there is very, it's very likely there is coming a time, depending on your state, that affirming basic biblical truth, Christ is king. The Jews did historically kill Jesus. That affirming that will get you punishment. And your, your confession, your courage is not tested because you confess the Apostles' Creed or the Council of Nicaea. We've been hitting on this for a couple of weeks. Courage is tested at the testing point. Courage is shown when an exact biblical truth is pressed in on, when it costs you something to confess it. Amen. And you, in the face of it, say, as Luther said at the Diet of Worms, uh, here I stand, unless convinced by Scripture, I can do no other. And so Christians have to be ready, and it's uncomfortable to get called anti-Semitic. We have been conditioned for so long to feel terrible about that. Right. Same way with racism Same and racism. xenophobia. Yeah, exactly. What were you going to add? Well, I was just for uh, as a biblical example. This is a uh, First Thessalonians chapter two. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, verses. Uh, I'll start with verse fourteen. Uh, Paul writing, you know, to the, Thessalo uh, the Thessalonian church. He says, "For you, brothers, became imitators of the churches of God in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, for you suffered the same things from your own countrymen as they did from the Jews, who killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and drove us out." and displease God, and oppose all mankind. According to the Apostle Paul, inspired by the Holy Spirit, um, he describes the Jews as those who killed the Lord Jesus Christ, and the prophets, and the apostles, and the apostles that they couldn't kill, they drove out, um, and he says, and they oppose all mankind. Uh, the Apostle Paul is saying that the Jews as a people, um, are the enemies of humanity. Now, I have ways of interpreting that. See, this is part of the reason why I like the view that I hold, because I think it's actually uh, the, by far, most charitable view. Yeah. Um, so, But I don't have time to get into that today, and we're going to have to save that for another time. But I'll say this. If you believe, I'll just say it like this. If you believe that uh, the nation state of Israel today, that these are the same people, genetically, covenantally, nationally, the same people as first century Jews at the time of Christ and the apostles, the Jews that Paul's talking about in First Thessalonians chapter 2. Um, and they haven't been saved yet. And you believe Romans 11 is a future spiritual promise for them to, of revival, for them to be saved, but that it hasn't happened yet then you would have to say that if you think the nation state of Israel today, 2,000 years later, it, these are the same people. These are the posterity, the descendants of the same Jews that Paul is talking about in 1 Thessalonians. Um, then, then these are the descendants of those who, according to Paul, killed Christ, the prophets, the apostles, or drove out the apostles, and opposed all mankind. Until... God saves them until a great revival. Right. Um, that's that's where things currently rest. Where are we currently at? As, na as, as the nation of Israel is still currently in a state of apostasy, in, in generally speaking, overall, the vast majority in rebellion against Christ and the Christian faith, um, then that's that would have to be that would have to be your view. Now, <laughs> again. We, we all killed Jesus. We, we have to be able to speak in multiple senses. We all killed Jesus by our sin. Also, no one technically, in a, in, so in one sense, no one killed Jesus. He freely laid down his life. In an ultimate eternal sense, he died to, to atone for the sins of all people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. We all sinned. We all made the cross necessary, all peoples. Um, and then in one sense, the Romans are the ones who literally drive the nails through his hands, but in the other sense, Pilate wants to wash his hands clean of it. He wants to let Jesus go, but he's up for re-election. He needs the Jews in his province to be on his side, and they are absolutely committed to, to his crucifixion. Crucify him. The question is, will, will, I, will this podcast, um, will, there be, will there be legal penalties hmm. 
in the state of Texas for this podcast right. one day. That's what that's what we're discussing. Uh, will will it be um, will it be a crime with legal penalties to say uh, to 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 read and preach First Thessalonians chapter Revelation two, two verse fifteen Matthew yep like will will that be a crime and so that's that's the point that's just one of, it's relevant for a ton of reasons it's relevant because your grandma um, is writing checks to Israel probably you know, on her fixed income. It's relevant because uh, guys uh, in the Republican Party run on a pro-Israel platform because they know that evangelicals, for the most part, are dispensational and and their theology informs the, their political vote, right? So it's relevant for those reasons. It's also relevant because uh, there are certain explicit verses in the Bible that you won't even be able to read right. out loud, out loud. It's like if the, this passes. it's like the laws about not being able to read portions of the Bible about homosexuality in the right. UK and in Canada. Right. Exactly. There are certain por- yeah, exactly. Certain scriptures on homosexuality that you can't read yep. out loud yep. in, in the and UK. You can be and sure Canada. the nuance bros will show up and be like, look, there's all these other verses in the Bible. Let's preach them for now. <laughs> you can be sure people will say yep, that. They They'll will compromise at the exact point of the battle. Right. Right where it matters. All right, let's do the uh, the final portion of the clip, Universalism with Clavin. Uh, Nathan's going to cue it up. Um, this is, for those of you who are just tuning in, we're, we're showing this was from Clavin's own show. Um, and uh, Cross Politic, if you want to watch that, he went yeah. on Cross Politic as a follow-up, and they pressed him on this issue of, wait a second, are you saying that somebody could deny Christ, but but technically... In the final analysis, when they die, stand before Christ and find out that they had actually been serving right. him all along and go to heaven. And uh, he says it explicitly on his show in this clip that we're about to show. Uh, but if there was any question, uh, he absolutely double yep. downs and confirms it on the show with uh, Cross Politic. And Chalk Knox at the end, I thought, did a really good job mm-hmm. uh, holding his feet to the fire and saying, uh, uh, no, dude, this is basic Christianity. Yeah. You're denying it. Yeah. Um, and so good on, good on you, uh, David Shannon. Uh, for a little bit of context, Knox too, about Clavin. His son is gay, yep. and he's come out and said, eh, it's not ideal, but I still, like, affirms it, basically. And he's Anglican, so there's some questions in the chat for those listening. Is he Catholic? Is he this? He's Anglican, and he has a gay son that he has refused to come out against. A gay son who's married. Gay son, well, yeah, married. Yeah. Works at Daily Wire? Where does he work? No, he has his own thing. It's, it's some conservative yeah, he's outlet, got his own though. Yeah, yeah, he's a conservative called, commentator. Uh, like heretics. Con- the... Conservative. So that, yeah, that's Spencer yeah. Clavin, and yeah. Andrew Clavin ha- has multiple times, so that yeah. that's not for years. Has um, he, he will, He'll say, the way that he'll word it is he'll say, um, I don't believe that homosexual relationships are normative or should be normative. So right. I, he would say, I believe it's morally wrong for these to be normative in society and for society to... Um, to incentivize, you know, right. push. So he would say, I, well, I, I stand against, you know, media constantly pushing, like, right. you know, you should be gay, and you, you know. Um, but, he, so he would say, it, uh, um, the, the normative, God's normative design for society is, you know, um, heterosexual, you know, monogamous, uh, lifelong marriage. Uh, that's the context for children, no. rearing children, blah, 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 all this kind of stuff. Uh, so that's normative, and that's the design, uh, but he'll carve out He'll carve out uh, and say, but for some individuals who are born this way, and he would mm. include his son under that right. banner, right. Uh, born this way, uh, they can't help it. And he and he, so he's not just saying, I still love my son despite the fact that he's right. in sin. That that would be one thing. He's not saying that. He's saying, um, I love my son, and he's and he's right with Christ. Yeah, my son is good. He's good. Yeah, being being in a homosexual marriage. All right, here we go. I think I got it. All right. Step by step guy. No. Nope. Turning post mill thinking in. That's not it. And oh, there it is. There it is. There it is. Beard. It's coming. Yeah. Get ready, guys. Oh, uh, when I did this, by the way. Okay. Yep. Just hit play. We'll play the whole thing. Just yeah, hit play. That, that's my race. I'm a Jew. I'm proud of my race. It's a, it's a great race. It's done many, many great things, including write the Bible. And, you know, I am a Jew. But that hasn't happened at all. Christians have welcomed me with open arms, except this Christ the King, anti-Semitic crowd. Christ is the King, and one day every knee will bow and recognize it because he's not just my King, he's King of the universe. But when you use that phrase to mean that God has abandoned his chosen people, the Jews, through whom he came into this world incarnate, and that he's broken his promises, 
his covenant with the Jews. You are quoting scripture like Satan does in the Bible. You are quoting scripture to your purposes, and that to me is specifically wicked. You know, All right, we already that addressed phrase that, so here at we Ben go. Shapiro, my friend Ben Shapiro, and, and, you know, I, un- I understand this. All, every, all of you who love Ben, and I love Ben, and Jordan Peterson, you all want to see them find Jesus because you know what joy and, and freedom that gives you, and, and you certainly feel that it alters your relationship with God. But when I think about this, to be honest with you, uh, you know, and I know some people will disagree with this, but I, life is not a game show where you guess the name of God and, and you get to go to heaven. Honk, you know, yes, the name is Jesus. I look at Ben's life, and I think if, if Ben were to embrace Jesus Christ, it would cause devastation to his family, to the people who love him, to the people who listen to him, to his position in the world. I just have this feeling that God has put this guy where he wants him to do what he wants him to do. And as you know, I feel that, you know, the Jews were not abandoned by God. All right. In the ultimate sovereign sense, yes. God has been Shapiro. I, I could affirm that statement yep. right there. God has been Shapiro yep. and everybody else. Every single person. For that matter. Justin Trudeau. Yep. Joe Biden. You know, like, yeah, God has everybody right where he wants them. Right where he wants them. Um, but that's not what Clavin's saying. Clavin's not saying in uh, in the ultimate sovereign sense, uh, God is meticulously sovereign over all people, even unbelievers, uh, and has them right where he wants them, uh, whether they acknowledge him or not, whether they realize it or not, they are being used by God to bring about his ultimate sovereign ends. That's not what he's saying. Um, Notice one of the things uh, that he gets at there is he he says, you you know, I know you all are, you know, you're praying for Ben and you're praying for Jordan Peterson. You want them to come to Christ. But uh, he says, but that would destroy Ben's life. Mm -hmm. It would destroy his relationships with his family. You know, do you you know how how destructive, how how chaotic, do you know how hard, how costly (laughs) <laughs> see, that's what he's getting. But that would cost Ben, you see, my friend Ben. Uh, if he came to Christ, there'd be a cost to following Christ, guys. You know, so knock it off. Stop that selfish prayer, you know, that, that Ben wouldn't go to hell and that he would, you know, come to saving faith in Jesus Christ. You know, stop being so selfish, guys. God has been right where he wants him, fulfilling his purpose. And also, um, we don't want to rock the boat. You know, Ben's got a good thing going. And... If he came to Christ, he might have to forsake father and mother. Mm. He might, you know, uh, a house, you know, of five might be divided against itself, two against three, and yeah. three against two. Wait a second. What? Uh, oh, those are the words of Jesus. Uh, there's always a cost to following Jesus. Yeah, it would be costly. If Ben came to saving faith in Christ, yes, it would be relationally costly. It would be financially costly. He'd yep. lose a lot of his following. I think he'd gain a lot too. I think he would too, yeah. You know, but but either way, financially, it might cost him, at least yep. in the short term. Uh, relationally, with his family, with his his parents, it would definitely cost him. Um, again, initially, but maybe God would use Ben to bring his parents to faith. That's exactly you know, what so. It is. Yep. Uh, when you follow Christ, it always costs up front. There's yep. always a cost. Um, but here's the thing: uh, Jesus says, and, and here's the, you know the Pietists don't want to talk about this, but uh, but Jesus says. Um, you know, Peter says, well, we, we've given up all these things for you, to follow you. And Jesus says, I tell you the truth, yeah. you know, those who have given up houses, you know, and, and family and parents and this and that, all these different things, uh, for my sake, I tell you the truth, will they not um, receive a uh, hundred times more? Mm. Uh, and he says, not only in the life to come, but yeah, in, this in this life, life. also. That's literally the words of Jesus. Says, but uh, And in this life also. And here's the deal. Uh, do some people follow Jesus and become martyrs? Yes. Yep. Mm-hmm. Persecuted all their life and eventually put to death for their faith in Jesus. Uh-huh. Yes, that is absolutely true. Uh, but it is also absolutely true, it is also absolutely true that, uh, that there are many who come to saving faith in Jesus and not only do they inherit eternal life in the life to come, but they also, their lives tangibly get better here on earth. Right? Children, obey your parents in the Lord. This is the first commandment with the promise that it may go well for you and that you may live a long life here, this life on the earth. Right? That um, there are, w- when someone comes to Christ, usually, I'm just speaking in, in, in 
ordinary terms, so this is not 100% guarantee for all people. Some will be martyred. Some will be drawn and quartered. Some will be uh, beheaded. Some will be, the Bible talks about that. That's the hall of fame or the hall of faith, Hebrews 11. Um, but also through faith, some conquered armies, right? There's the victors yep. and then there are the martyrs, but yep. they're all in the ultimate sense, victors in Christ. Um, but some people uh, pay, they pay a high price and some people, um, they actually conquer in this mm -hmm. life, uh, but all through faith. Uh, so by faith, some conquer. By faith, some are conquered temporarily in this life, but they receive um, um, infinitely more in the life to come. But ordinarily, in a nation like ours, right? If we're talking about North Korea, maybe it's a little bit different. But in these United States of America, even as bad as things have gotten today, even as bad as things have gotten with as much hangover from, from a Christendom past that we still have by the grace of God, in a nation like ours, if someone comes to Christ today, most of the cost, because there is a cost to following Jesus always, but most of that cost will be paid up front. Most of the cost will be initial. It'll be the initial loss of relationships. It'll be the initial loss, maybe of a job. The initial loss of- and As a multimillionaire, uh, he's not going to be out on the street. He'll be okay. There are people that will be, or will right. lose their life. Right. Ben Shapiro will have an audience until the day yeah, he but dies. The point ben is, Shapiro will be just was, fine. Even if it was, I mean- you said before, Joel, that in the early church, you could go from being a pauper to being well, well off, off right? from one day to the next by by legitimately converting to Christ. Right, because they shared everything yep. in common. Yep. Because there was there was it was an unparalleled degree of charity, generosity, and Christian unity that, that nobody nobody else had. Yep. And that's Josephus, who was yep. not a Christian. He's you know he was a Jew, um, who is saying he says it's a very peculiar thing. Uh, that a person could go from being a pauper to a prince virtually overnight simply by joining the ranks of the Christians. Yep. You're saying they're that generous and that kind in the way that they care for their own. So the, the point is, um, by paying the, the cost, there's a cost to being Christ's disciple. We know that. and that. But my, my point is that ordinarily, and especially in a nation like America that has so many rights and freedoms still on the books today, even, even with an, a great erosion, there's still many left over today. Ordinarily, um, the vast majority of that cost will be an initial cost paid up front. But then after paying that uh, cost, most Christians, because of their faith in Jesus and obedience to his law word, um, in the long run, and I'm not just talking about heaven, guaranteed in the life to come, but even in this life, they lose initially, but then they gain a ton, not only in the life to come, but in this life as well. And Jesus says that. Um, and that's and that is what happens. Why? Why? Uh, because uh, because you forsake your sin, you embrace Christ and repentance. You seek to be obedient to His law, not to earn salvation, but as a response of gratitude for the free salvation you have by grace through faith in Christ alone. And guess what? When you start obeying God's law and you practice more integrity in business, and uh, you keep your wedding vows to your wife, and you become a, a better father with your children, and you become a better friend, then uh, guess what? Uh, Life goes better ordinarily. Right. Are there some exceptions to the rule? Are, is there persecution at times? Yes. But ordinarily, especially in a free nation, mostly free nation like ours, um, somebody who embraces Christ, there will be a cost, but most of the cost will be their sin, which is a cost, good riddance, right? We want to get rid of our sin. It'll cost you your sin. It'll always cost that. And in addition to your sin, it might also cost you um, initially up front, some relationships, some status, maybe a job, maybe some money. Yep. Uh, but in the long run, and I'm not just speaking eternally in the life to come, certainly an infinite gain in heaven, but even in this life, initial loss, but then progressively there's gain. Right. In this life, there is gain. Why? Because, uh, because God will not be mocked and a man will reap what he sows. And by following God's blueprints for living life in God's world things ordinarily will go better for you. Right. So, um, And Ben Shapiro might say some things that are actually based for the first time if he converts. Yeah, exactly. Yep. So there would be a loss for Ben Shapiro, but um, because we love Ben Shapiro and want him to be saved, right. uh, dude, embrace, embrace the loss. Uh, count it all as loss. Yes. Next to knowing Christ, you are yeah. saved. I think a famous Jew said that at one point. <laughs> <laughs> the famous Jew did say that yep okay well uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in and um, pray for Clavin that he would repent uh, for the especially the universalism um, and uh, pray for Ben uh, and his salvation yep. pray for Jordan Peterson who's not a Jew but yep. uh, he needs Jesus too it's not just that Jews need Jesus um, pray that uh, that Jordan Peterson would be saved and converted 
If he's not already, um, pray pray that, I, but I don't think he is, uh, pray that Ben would be uh, converted and uh, pray that Andrew uh, Clavin, if he is a Christian, and I say if because uh, he espoused universalism, it's not the first time he's done it, and he doubled down with cross-politic, and it was explicit. Um, and that that is not just a secondary issue. That is a, um, a denial of primary doctrine, the exclusivity of Christ. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And uh, so so please pray uh, that uh, Clavin, that God would save him. Um, I lean towards the, uh, him being unconverted. He's just not a Christian. Um, he's affirming his gay son uh, in his gay marriage and, uh, and espousing universalism and also uh, essentially saying that... Uh, if you hold to covenant theology, then uh, you're satanic, wicked, and um, anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitic. So not uh, the scoreboard's not looking great for Clavin. Um, so again, God alone sees a heart. Man looks at the outward appearance, but Jesus says you'll know them by their fruit. Mm -hmm. um, and and we are supposed to look at someone's profession and their life and their character and their son and their affirmation of his son and those kind of things. And so uh, based off of that, I have no confidence that Clavin is a Christian. So uh, pray for Ben to be saved, pray for Jordan, but also pray for Clavin mm, yeah. uh, because he needs Jesus. And uh, if he is saved, um, then he quickly needs to uh, yep. recant yep. and repent. Um, and for all of you guys who are listening to this, who have seen all the Twitter war back and forth, um, you need you need to uh, be aware of the times. You need to know the play. The play right now is not, uh, there's this Christ the King group uh, that um, is saying death to Jews, and that's anti-Semitic. That's not the play. The play is there's this Christ the King group, and they're not dispensational Zionists who are uh, shilling for the nation right. state of Israel every day of the week, and who believe in the third temple, believe in a divine right to the land, and believe that America should support them as a political ally with billions of taxpaying dollars. And anything less than that is anti-Semitism. Right. Once upon a time, anti-Semitism uh, meant that you don't like Jews. Today, anti-Semitism seems to mean that certain Jews or adjacent to Jews don't like you. Mm -hmm. And there's a big difference between the two. Uh, don't fall for it. Christ is king. Thanks for tuning in. To help you set up your own privatized banking system so that you can prosper and pass along tax-free wealth to the next generation and teach them to be financially responsible with that wealth. Your system will guarantee positive and continuous growth of your money, income tax protected, for the rest of your life and beyond. Additionally, you will create a pool of capital that can be used to grow additional wealth using the same money in more than one place at the same time. For families, investors, and those near or already in retirement, your system will provide a buffer against market volatility to help you avoid selling off your investment portfolio during prolonged market downturns. Now, for those who are struggling with paying off high interest bearing credit cards or car loans or student loans, there's no worries. We'll teach you how to use your private family bank to accelerate the payoff of your consumer debt, including a monthly step-by-step -step guide. Turning post-mill thinking into post-mill action with private family banking. Now that's a good thing. Find out how this powerful approach to a multi-generational wealth building can work for you and your family by emailing banking at privatefamilybanking.com. You'll receive a free ebook and a link to schedule your free 30 minute consultation today. In a world where giants like Google and Microsoft reign supreme, there emerges a new challenger, a beacon of hope in the digital landscape, introducing PaxMail, the email company that's rewriting the rules of the game. Say goodbye to data mining and intrusive ads because at PaxMail, your privacy is our top priority. But that's just the beginning. With our docs and drive features, you'll experience seamless collaboration like never before. Whether you're working solo or with a team, PaxMail has got you covered. And here's the kicker. All the founders are Christian abortion abolitionists through and through. Our commitment to fostering a digital environment that respects all life is unwavering. 
That means no algorithms pushing harmful content, no tracking your every move, just a clean, based space for you to thrive. PaxMail, empowering you to take back control of your digital life. Sign up today at paxmail.cc and experience the difference. Again, that's paxmail.cc. Sign up today. 